for now, let's just uh, let's hear a little bit about Hamza. All right, you go on F sharp. Can you hear the ukulele? Yep. software developer turned ML engineer, ML engineer, an indie hacker by heart. He loves ideating, implementing, and launching data-driven projects. His previous career included a stint with Pickhands, Realist budget ML and UTDL TLDR mm, UTDL TLDR. Well, based on his learnings from deploying ML in production for predictive maintenance. Use cases in his previous startup, he co created his NML, an open source ML ops framework to create reproducible ML pipelines. And I was so excited about it when I first heard. I couldn't help but get him on the meetup. Then Ben came along and said, why don't we do some pair programming? So this is very special. Today we've got another co-host, Ben Epstein. And welcome to the MLOps community meetup. I hope you brought your computer because we're about to code. Here we go. All right. There you wow. go, Hamza, my man. That was special. That was something special to make of this. <laughs> All right. So just uh, so we're clear before we even start, I have to give a full disclosure that I, I am very stoked on what Hamza and ZenML are doing, but I should also tell everyone that I also invested in ZenML, so I'm very biased. Don't listen to me about anything. I think everyone should go out there and start using it right now because it is the best product on the market. So that being said, I'm going to let Ben, who is the third party neutral source, come and jump in. And then Hamsa, you can share your screen now and we can get cracking. Cool. Thanks, Demetrius. Um, yeah. So just for a little bit of background before I hand it over to Hamza, uh, my name is Ben Epstein. I work for a different uh, startup in the ML space um, called Galileo. But the reason that I'm on today and the reason that Demetrius and I are really, really stoked today uh, about this and all of the future meetups like this and ZenML um, in particular is that we had been on a lot of meetups and a lot of kind of ML talks around the entire ML space, not just here. And we're noticing a lot of talks with a lot of slides and a lot of kind of conversation, but not a lot of live coding. Um, and as an ML engineer, as a coder, that's a little bit frustrating. I, I am always really interested in reading the docs and, and seeing a product um, kind of firsthand. And so Demetrius and I thought it'd be really, really fun to start um, doing those with the MLOps community with, with great open source uh, products and yes. ZML being a really awesome product. We wanted to start with it. So today is going to be a very live coding um, session in the general channel, as well as in the chat, I put uh, the code instructions to kind of get up and running. Um, I'm going to be doing this on my computer as well, and I'll be fielding questions if they're is something that somebody runs and it breaks, um, we'll sort of stop and we'll talk to Hamza and we'll kind of figure out why that might be a problem uh, kind of right in the middle. So everyone by the end of this should understand ZenML, should have built a model, should have kind of uh, used ZenML for inferencing and for model tracking um, and should be experts in ZenML. So I'll yes. pass it over to Hamza to kind of get that's, us going. And that's so cool that you say that, Ben, and it is something that we want to make sure of, like this is how we want to move forward. This is also very much the first time that we're doing this. So be patient, bear with us if anything does go wrong. 
And now it's all you, Hamza. All right. So I would have to thank Ben and Demetrius. I mean, that was a fantastic introduction. Uh, I couldn't have asked for better, uh, especially the song. Um, it is going to be a bit programming heavy today. I'm just going to perhaps start with an introduction about ZenML, um, like perhaps also myself. And uh, we do have a repository um, that you can use to follow along. So it, it's public, it's called the NBA-ML-Pipeline. You'll know why in a second. And you can just clone it and run this one Jupyter notebook, um, which is in the root. So I, because it is the first meetup that we're doing like this, I also, you know, I'm going to sort of try to wing it. If, if something goes wrong, do let me know in the chat. I have two computers working. So if I look right, that's the one that I'm streaming my camera from. And if I'm looking straight, that's, that's the one that you're, so the screen that you're seeing. Cool. Um, and Ben, if there are any questions in the chat, I probably wouldn't notice them because of that. So just, you know, like feel free to pop in and, and let me know. So for sure, I'll be on that duty. Amazing. So we have now around 90 minutes lined up. And what we did today was um, like try to go through three chapters of the MLOps story uh, using ZenML. And I think uh, it makes sense to start with ZenML anyway. So who are we? Like, what are we doing? Who am I? Uh, like perhaps a short history. So my name is Hamza. Of course, I am the co-founder of ZenML. And I started this whole MLOps journey about around 2017, like four or five uh, years ago, when we were trying to build these predictive maintenance uh, machine learning pipelines that were used to predict um, when things on the road would break. So something like, um, let's say, trucks or buses or trains. So like using really sensor data, we were looking at it and like trying to figure out through the CAN bus data, like pressures and temperatures, whether things would fail. And, like in 2017, I think this is where, you know, the whole MLOps stuff was starting. I, I don't, I didn't even know the term back then, but we were trying to build these systems which are robust and reproducible. And what we found that we lacked with the tools that were there, um, or well, like what we had to do anyway in-house was that we had to build, like we had so many tools coming up and, you know, like I don't need to tell this community this, they already know all the tools that are coming up. But there was no real way as a data scientist, and you know that's also my background. I'm a, like more of a software developer, but I did do a lot of data science. Um, there was no easy performant way of getting um, like a ML pipeline up in production in a reproducible and fairly robust way with the abstractions that we thought were quite obvious. Um, and uh, uh, like there were some projects that sprung up afterwards, but in, in, in 2017, this was, wasn't the case. So we, so we like tried to ad hoc solve these problems in house. Um, and, you know, all these learnings, we, around 2020, we, we tried to put them all together in this framework. Uh, and we called it like ZenML because the goal was, and because as a data scientist who wants to get their models out in production, you know, you don't want to rely on, um, software engineers or the ops team to do that. What you want to do is you want to have ownership of your models throughout the entire process. And because you have so many tools that you're using in the ML workflow, uh, you want to also translate those tools into the production workflow and sort of have a seamless link between the two. And that's what we're aiming for with ZenML. And that's what we try to illustrate in this picture, right? So we, we have on the left side, a lot of the things that you're doing with MLOps, uh, you know, performance drift is happening, continuous training you need to set up, uh, scaling, model evaluation, all that stuff that there are so many cool tools that do specific things in it, but there's no real, there wasn't any really easy way to put that all together in a pipeline to get to the right side, which is essentially, um, you know, like a Zen mode situation where you can get the tools that you want in an abstraction that you like, which is fairly easy and translate it from a setting where you're doing a playground training exercises in a Jupyter Notebook, let's say, to a really robust production pipeline that your software engineering team would also be uh, like happy with. And of course, that involves in the infrastructure as well uh, as the libraries. So that was the, like, that was the whole thing. And uh, essentially, that's where like, ZenML sprang up. 
And in a lot of ways, we internally compared ourselves with something like Next.js in the web development world, like a framework that has a lot of batteries built in and it allows you to you know, do a lot of things in web development that were not possible before because simply because of the abstractions that were introduced that just clicked for the community. And if anything, ZenML is an exercise in finding the right abstractions and um, sort of trying to standardize the tooling in a way that you can plug and play different tools um, and create different MLOP stacks, so to speak, um, at your leisure, uh, depending on what you want, and span it uh, across projects. I'm just looking at the right here. Have there been any dependencies issues so far? Uh, there was there was one, but it was solved by using uh, the 2020 resolver in pip. Um, oh. I, I didn't have that issue, but if somebody else does, uh, check the chat for the syntax. Cool. So there's a. I'm just gonna you know now I like talked a lot about like the project and where we're coming from. I think it's always um, you know I'm a coder. Everyone in the call is probably like looking forward to get their hands dirty with it. So let's start with the repository. Um, one thing I have failed is a proper readme, um, but uh, like Ben was like very kind to share the instructions. So we have two requirements files. I think the one that you want to install is the requirements for txt, which only has two dependencies. Um, we just made the latest NML release one hour before this demo. If anything is breaking, that would be fantastic for us because then we can fix it immediately, but it is a new release. So uh, please bear with us if something does go wrong. Um, I'm gonna now go ahead and start, assuming that everybody has done a pip install of the requirements and has opened up Jupyter um, Notebook. Nice, all right. So the first thing you do is initialize XML. Now you, this is very similar to DVC or Git, uh, like you do Git in it. And there's a bunch of stuff that happens in the background, which we will be like coming back to that is very important. You can already notice the word stack there. Um, but let's go on and open up chapter one of this book that I'm gonna try to guide everyone through today. Um, is anybody a fan of NBA in the call by any chance? I'm just gonna look to the right for a few seconds to see, because that will make this call a bit easier. Sure. <laughs> okay, so we have one at least. So um, like for, for, for all the people who do watch the NBA, um, you know that the game has gone through a lot of transitions. So like basketball has gone through a lot of transitions and what has happened, um, what especially was interesting and internally at ZNML we're all fans, so, you know, we're talking about this all the time. There was, there was a moment in the NBA in around 2016 where this player called Steph Curry, who is probably one of the greatest, or if not the greatest of all time, no arguments today, but let's keep moving. Um, sank this shot that actually changed the whole landscape of the game, right? So before this, it was all like Michael Jordan and, you know, Shaq and, you know, they were doing slam dunks and being very aggressive. But, you know, like Steph Curry, as you can see in the GIF, he always used to do these really long shot three pointers right at the death from downtown. And, you know, it was it was something that was, uh, that was not really common. And, you know, in the community, people always used to say, that changed the game. That one shot that won them the game, the Golden State Warriors in the last two seconds, was a strategy. Like it then, like after this, every team in the NBA started just following and copying his strategy of just scoring three pointers and not going up to the net, right? So that is where we thought, hmm, that means the data drifted, right? So basically, there used to be a certain amount of three pointers in the game before. Then the shot happened. And then after that, the data drifted, the whole reality, the whole domain changed. And how do we uh, like sort of verify that? Well, we verify that by building a very simple ZNML pipeline. And that's the first chapter of the story. Um, it's just going to be building a one shot training pipeline, which lets you just write a step, create a pipeline, run it locally, see what happens, right? At this point, let's, uh, look at what a pipeline is and what a step is, right? So the step is in ZenML, you can just import the step from ZenML.step import step, and you can decorate any Python function with it, right? The only, um, the only um, important thing is you need to like type annotate it. So in this particular function, for example, this is exemplary, 
uh, we have something that goes into a function, which is the imported config, and append as frames comes out. I want to emphasize, by the way, it's this is not going to be about machine learning. It's more about the operationalization around it. So you know, the model itself need not be so cool, but we'll try to get to a, to a nice model at the end. Um, so that's how a step looks like, right? I mean, what am I doing in the step? I'm just using the NDA API, um, which you have in the requirements, and querying a bunch of seasons data and just sort of concatenating it in a way that you know we can feed it potentially downstream to a machine learning model and concatenating it together and returning it. And yeah, that's how a step looks like. You can return anything you want here. You can return multiple things or a single thing, but um, whatever you do return here can is what we call an artifact. So a step returns artifacts. They also get as input artifacts from other screen, uh, from other steps. So the artifacts are persisted in a so-called artifact store and are kept track of by a so-called metadata store. Um, right now, these two things are local. So the artifact store right now, as you initialized it, is local. It's, it's just a file system somewhere. So this data frame has been persisted by Zenml when you once you run this pipeline, um, will be persisted in the artifact store. So let's see how that works. So I'm just gonna run the first step. And I mean, my computer is a bit slow, but hopefully we get through this, yes. And then we're gonna start building our pipeline. So as you notice, there are um, a few steps in the pipeline. I, I, I imported step um, some from outside the repository. So you don't always have to put them in a Jupyter notebook. I thought it would be a bit easier if we just put the steps outside a bit, just to focus on the important stuff, which is linking the steps together. So we have three steps, as you saw in the diagram. Um, the first step imports the data, that's, that's this guy. Then it splits the data into two data frames, the reference data set and the comparison one. And then it like passes it along to a drift detector with both the data sets, which calculates a report. Right, so that's an abstract definition of the pipeline that I just saw. It's it's simple Python. Basically, it's like Keras, right? Like the functional API of Keras. You can decorate it with the add pipeline. It's a function. It works. Now, how do you actually run this pipeline, right? And this is a function. You need to call it. So at this point, you can start plugging in and passing in your steps into the pipeline. And here's where I want to make the first segue into our first integration. So XML, of course, is bringing together a lot of tools, right? It's, it's a pipelining tool, but it, the focus is on integrating with other tools and making them work together nicely. Um, the first tool that we love at XML, and there's a blog on it if you want to like, read about it, is evidently. Um, I'm not sure if Elena has been on um, the MLOps Community Podcast, but she should. She, it's, it's been... Um, like a breath of fresh air, their approach to calculate drift. Um, and it's open source. It's just a pip library just like us. So we, it's, you know, it's, it's relatively easy for us to integrate with it. And what evidently does is that it takes a reference data set, takes a comparison data set and calculates a report just like we want, right? So that would be the perfect um, choice for it. So what people following along should now do is install the evidently integration, right? I'm, I'm talking about integration. So the first thing you want to do is install the integration. This will simply install the evidently library at the appropriate version. And then you can see that XenML will then expose um, an evidently step that you can use. So before this point, we were defining steps on our own, right? You can do this with full utility because this is just Python. But you know, XenML provides you some goodies it, uh, it helps you by making these pre-configured um, sort of steps that you can just use and plug and play within a pipeline. And, and we plan to grow this out into like a step zoo, so to speak, so that people can just you know start using these. Um, but you know we don't take an opinion on the exact interface. If you want to use them, use them. If not, you can always build on top of them and subclass them and stuff. But currently, it's a very simple step. It takes a column mapping. That's not something we need. And it asks you, what sort of drift do you want? So we want a data drift, so we're just gonna um, initialize that function. Okay, all this to say, 
uh, we should now start running this. So I'm going to run it while while I talk. So uh, yeah, I haven't initialized the pipeline, of course. Okay. I should this see. So hey, I'm going to stop here. This is why notebooks should not be used in production. So just saying that not gonna. I don't want flames to go up. <laughs> but if you if you don't run the right cells, that's what happens. Yeah, so let's go again. Okay. So here's what's happening. So like what's happening is right now we have a data analysis pipeline, the one that we want. Um, we have plugged in the exact functions we want the importer to look like, the exact functions we want um, the, the uh, like drift splitter to look like, and the evidently drift detector. And you, you would have seen that the drift uh, splitter function that we're using is taking a configuration file. Oops, that's wrong. Right. Excuse me, I think I skipped ahead a bit. I, I should have set the local stack. You would not have seen that prompt if you, if you ran it. So that was just something that was a bit legacy while I was testing. Oh, yeah, cool. So, um, so it's going to split it based on a particular date. So we we actually went back and we saw that it was 2016 February, yeah, 27th of February, that this game happened, and we just split the data. We got all the data and we're splitting it, and we're like generating, and like a drift report. Um, and that's the first pipeline. So any questions so far? Yeah, you you, you got it. Perfect. I'll jump in with I'll jump in with a question. Uh, why? So you said that all of your functions have to be type annotated. Yeah. Um, first of all, why why is that, and how does ML help in case um, they type annotates, but they type annotate wrong, or they pass in the mm. wrong data based on the type annotation? Yeah. So if that happens, then so if you like pass it in with the wrong data, then it's going to fail with the uh, with an exception, and it's going to say yeah. You know, you you specified it's a pandas data frame, but you're passing in NumPy or something, and then it's going to give an exception. But I think um, the other interesting bit is that if you if you want to use in your function um, a type which is like you know specific to you, let's say you have a I don't know like a random ass class, like a data class or something that you want to you know which is not known to anyone, um, then you can also return that here. But in order to do that, what you'll have to do is specify what we call a materializer, a custom materializer. And a materializer is simply the logic of persisting and reading from the file system, which is the artifact store, right? So we have you covered on the most common ones, pandas, numpy, um, TensorFlow, Torch, you know, models and all that. But if you have a special object that you want, you can simply subclass the materializer class and um, just, you know, Insert your your serialization logic, and it'll work um, out of the bat. So, so it's it's supposed to be extensible that way. We didn't want to just limit you to a certain set of types that you can use. You can use basically any type you want, and all you need to take care of then, of course, is persisting it to and from the artifact store. Um, because what's happening is it's not simply calling functions and passing them in memory to the next function. What's happening is that between the steps. It's persisting in the artifact store, right? So you're sort of writing and reading um, from the artifact store, and uh, that's how data is passed through the pipeline. And that's, of course, not important in a local setting, but in a setting where you have a pipeline running, let's say, Qflow, which we'll show, then you know, um, like you can't afford to have a local file system in a Docker image that runs. But yeah, we'll get to that. Oh, yeah. So, as you can see, the, the importer worked. So the function I saw you is just fetched all the data from NDA until 2021. It has ran the splitting step. It has ran the evidently step, and it finished in 53 seconds. My computer is a bit wooden. It might be faster for you guys. So now, how do we answer this question, right? So what was the question that we wanted to answer? Was there drift or not? So for that, we need to actually see what the evidently profile step outputted. And you know, unlike you know, so we want this to be for the machine learning workflow, and we understand that it's important for people to be able to fetch pipelines within a notebook, 
like you can't just run pipelines and then you know have to go through a bunch of pain to fetch them back into the notebook. So what we do is we just expose a simple API where you can fetch any pipeline from any stack and uh, it gets uh, represented right here in this little object called pipeline. Uh, I called it P. And within a pipeline, there are runs. So you know that particular pipeline only ran once. So there's there's only one, but I can, I mean, maybe I can run this again. Mm -hmm. And you might've noticed that this was way faster, by the way. The reason is caching. So we are caching all the steps if they've been run before. So in this case, this pipeline just ran through, but you would be able to see that, you know, now there are two runs, right? So we fetched the pipeline, there were two runs. And then I can go to the last run. And then from within the run, we can get steps. So we have, uh, you know, we need to get the drift detector step, right? That, this one. So let's pass that in. And you can see, yeah, we got it. And it is indeed an evidently profile step. And now we do something which is, um, which I personally really like, which is our visualizers. So um, we also, as part of the evidently visualizer, we created our own visualizer to visualize the results of um, um, this particular step. That's nothing special from us. This is all uh, like credit to evidently. We just wrapped it in our visualizer library. So you know you can you can create custom visualizers as well for your custom visualizations. Um, we just happen to have created one which works in a Jupyter notebook and just brings up the evidently main visualization. So you can see that drift is detected for 100% of the features. Um, so it, indeed, yes, the answer was yes. Def query did change the game, so nobody can argue with me otherwise now um, because I have data to prove it, right? So um, before 2016, reference distribution looked a certain way. And then after 2016, it completely drastically changed, right? So the number of three pointers that happened in the game was indeed very different and evidently makes this really easy to understand, right? So these are just buckets. You can see from zero to four scored, there was so many uh, games which had only three, um, three or four three pointers, you know? Um, but then, you know, it started increasing as you went down time. So, Curry from downtown indeed changed the game. That's why he's the goat. But uh, we can uh, we can now uh, stop for questions in the end of chapter one. Did anyone um, encounter any errors? I mean, this was quite an easy one. Yeah, everything ran for me. Uh, if anybody's having that issue, the dash F flag on the install will fix it. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, everything else ran pretty smoothly. Perfect. All right, so you talk a Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was gonna ask if you had any more details on the caching mm. uh, step, how that, that pipeline that you ran ran so quickly. Well, that's that's a good question. So because you know, if we had passed this uh, the these steps through um, in memory, then of course caching wouldn't have worked. But what we are doing is we're persisting these the output of each step in the artifact store, right? And which is a file system in my local machine right now. Um, and ZenML has this metadata store that is tracking all these artifacts. And what ZenML does, it's a very simple caching mechanism. It says, okay, for any pipeline, if nothing in the input signature has changed, so no parameters have changed, no artifacts from an upstream step have changed, or an upstream step itself has changed, or indeed um, the code itself has changed. So you're like, if I had changed this code, it would have also invalidated caching. Um, because it makes a hash of the code. Um, if all of these things are true, then it makes an assumption that the output of the step will be the same, right? So if you pass in the same configuration, the same artifacts, blah, 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 the same code, it's gonna produce the same artifact. If that assumption holds true, then which is very simple, almost trivial for ZenML to just say, hey, in this pipeline, the game data importer, the date based splitter, and the evidently drift detector simply didn't change. So why do we need to recompute them? We can just pass the artifacts down to downstream steps from the pointers that we already have. So, so that's what happened with caching. So that's the, that's the detail on that. And what if you need something to rerun always? Like what, what if so you were pulling from an API or something? Well, that's quite easy. You can just do at the step level or at a level of uh, the pipeline, enable cache equals false, right? 
And then if you run this again, you would see that it's running and fetching this again. So it, it, it would simply just start again. So, so that's, uh, that's the, it's quite simple. And if you, like you would usually do this when you have a step which is querying some external state, right? So let's say you have a step which is querying an API. So nothing in the configuration has changed, nothing in the artifacts have changed, but you are querying an API that might have changed, right? So you can just enable the cache, you can like disable the cache, excuse me, um, in that scenario. And we'll actually do that as we move to the next chapter. Awesome. Cool. Okay, so we got, like we went through the post execution, uh, we went through running a simple pipeline. I hope, um, so Mert had this problem. So Mert, maybe you could just restart everything and start from the top with the error that you're having. Maybe you just need to set in, um, set a ZenML local stack. And if you're having real trouble, then just delete the .zen folder in your root repository and just start the initialization again. That would be my little tip. Okay, so let's let's keep moving. So, okay, so we detected drift, right? So, I mean, big deal. It was fun for us. It was a little project, but you know, when we look at MLOps and these problems like drift detection, that's not how they happen, right? You don't have a fixed point in time where drift has hypothetically happened, and you fix that drift to this, um, and you essentially, uh, you know like uh, they always have it from a fixed point. That's not what happens. What happens is you have a way more complicated pipeline like this. So let's say we were trying to build a machine learning model for the betters out there that were predicting the next week's uh, games and how many three pointers there would be for the home team, right? So uh, if the Golden State Warriors are facing Oklahoma again, how many three pointers would they score? So that's, you know, that would look more like this. So we would have an importer step with some feature engineering, with some encoding, some machine learning splitting, training, maybe even testing. And while we're doing that, we might as well also detect drift, whether the drift has happened from the last time it trained or not, right? So let's say you're training every month with the last month's data. So you always wanna know whether the last month has drifted or not. If it has drifted, maybe you don't wanna train, right? Maybe you do want to train still, that's up to you. Anyway, you do want to know this. So what, what we're gonna, what we're looking for is some, some form of a drift alert mechanism, right? So something that you can just alert and like tell us the drift for the latest pipeline has happened. And so that's, that's one part of it. The other part of it is whenever you have a training pipeline, what you really want to be doing is tracking, um, like tracking, all the parameters and um, hyperparameters as well and sort of um, comparing the runs as they happen. So of course, like ZenML also tracks these things, but they're tracked from the perspective of, um, you know, like uh, let's say artifacts or caching. But uh, there are other libraries that do it and have different visualizations um, like weights and biases or MLflow, uh, MLflow tracking specifically that you might want to use. Um, just because they're a bit more developed and you know you can see the visualizations that you, and a lot of people like MLflow for that. So we don't wanna, you know, again, it's about connecting these tools together and not replacing them. So um, that brings me neatly to the second integration. So the second integration is with MLflow. So um, what you do is within a, a ZML pipeline, you want to have a link between a pipeline run or a step run and an MLflow experiment. So that's what we're gonna show now. And the other thing that you want to do, of course, is you don't want to just run this one off, but you just want to run it in a continuous schedule, right? You want to run it outside of your machine in a stack that sort of works with ML flow with evidently um, and pings you on Discord, let's say, if drift happens. So, so what we're going to try to build is an ML is an ML stack consisting of all these elements, and we're going to show you how ZML with the Qflow and ML flow and evidently integrations help you do that. So let's move on. So that's how a pipeline like that might look like. You can see that it's quite, quite uh, well, not so simple as the one before, but it's, you know, it does have some things which are interesting. We have the importer step, the feature engineering step and all that. I mean, I, I went through the diagram, so this is just in code what the diagram looked like. 
um, we I wanted to show you specifically from within that step um, the the MLflow functionality. Okay, so how do you use MLflow within ZenML? So very simple. Another like we and as you might have already noticed, we love decorators. They're quite easy. So all you do is above your training pipeline, you enable MLflow. You just say okay. Uh, from this MLflow integration, I want to just enable MLflow. And then when you're defining your step, uh, and I again, I only have a few steps in the notebook, all of them are in the repository. Um, this is the trainer step. And all I can now, like I can use MLflow exactly as I would normally, right? I have import MLflow, and then I do an MLflow.sqlrun.autolog, which um, you know is just logging everything that's an MLflow functionality for people who know MLflow. When you just train the scikit-learn model, it's just a regressor. It's going to log all the metrics and everything and the model. So it's just going to log everything. So let's see how that works. So I ran through that. I'm just going to run this once now. Um, hopefully everything works. Uh, it's going to, um, I just plugged in the functions like before, passed in some of the, um, configurations that we needed. And I think what's what's really important here is we are changing the drift splitter step to not be from the bam bam shot in 2016, but just taking, let's say the last week. So let's say this runs every week. We're just gonna take the reference to be everything which is after the curry short up until one week ago. And the thing that you actually detect drift on the thing which is one week ago. So, um, or the current week. So you see something happen, right? So this went through, and if I go to my Discord now, in my demo channel, which is now public, um, you would see a very simple thing, drift not detected. This is, I mean, you could you, know, you could do it with, oh, other people are doing it, so that's amazing. Uh, let's see how many people pop up here. It is a public uh, channel, so you can feel free to do it. We're gonna disable it afterwards, and you can populate it with your own. Discord channels. Um, you can also see that we memed it up a bit when you combine your drain and drop pipelines. lines. Okay. So that's my team, by the way. They are obviously watching this and uh, seem to really enjoy uh, memes. <laughs> like, so that's a good one. The drift wasn't detected though, right? So for some it is, for some it isn't. Anyway, so, you, so we ran this once. And you can see that it was detected. Um, is there any problem so far? No one's posted and mine ran cleanly. Okay, that's perfect. So, so what has happened now? So we have ran this pipeline um, with the import MLflow, right? And if you go over to now, if you open up MLflow, it's quite easy to open up the UI. Um, you would be able to see now a new experiment is created, exactly the same name as training underscore pipeline. Right, the thing that we created. Hamza, um, so I got an error running the ML flow command. Um, okay, there was an unexpected extra requirement um, support mm. ZenML. Mm, could you paste that error over, or maybe you, you want to change the port to something that's freer on your end? Sure. If no one else got it, then we'll definitely just keep going. Let's see. So usage ML flow UI. Ah, supports an ML. It might be that, like, you might want to just run this on your terminal, not on the Jupyter notebook, and replace the local ML flow backend with the exact path. So your path is support slash ZenML slash local stores slash ML runs. So I'm just going to type that out for you. So. Yep, that worked. That worked? Very cool. Yeah, it must be just how Jupyter parses these things. In You're on a MacBook, I suppose? Uh, yeah, but it's probably that. Yeah, OK. Cool. So one run happened with the training pipeline. And you can see that within the training pipeline, everything was logged. This is the auto log functionality. You have all the parameters, you know, everything you'd ever want, basically. Um, especially in a production setting, these are important. And you know, one of the things that XML enables with this is 
of course, you're you're using Evidently now. You're using Discord, but you're also using MLflow in a uh, and you're establishing in in a very easy way a link between um, the trainings that you're having and you know the deployments that you do. So if you if you do have hundreds of trainings, thousands of trainings, you're always going to keep track. There's always going to be one ID that sort of pins all these tools with one source of with with like one source of truth. So that's really that's really where reproducibility comes into play, right? So I'm going to pause and talk about reproducibility uh, as I run Excel. You know, like reproducibility is not just about running the same thing again. It's also about being able to see if the same steps, if you run them again, can give you the exact same result. And with if you set up ZenML in a way where there's a shared artifact and metadata store, then whenever you run pipelines using this caching mechanism that I talked about, it's going to reproduce the same result. So if you run, if when you run it, if I run it, we're going to have shared instances where we can reproduce all the steps. And even if you don't want to actually execute them, you can get the results of, of your, um, you can get the result of your pipeline runs using this simple API. So here's what I did. So using the same easy um, API as before, I now visualized my drift again. And this time there is no drift. And you can see why. I mean, it's not so bad, right? Like it's uh, it's very, yeah, I would say it's very trivial um, to see why, why the data didn't drift because they were close enough, right? Yeah, I'm not talking uh, data drift detected false. Okay, that's, that's an interesting message. Yes, data was not, uh, drift was not detected. Anyway, so how do we get this setting now? So how do we, go from this local setting where we're now still running this in a local um, you know, environment to an environment where, you know, in the cloud or something where, where it's, it can run potentially outside of the scope of my computer and uh, can populate shared metadata and artifact stores. And that's this notion of stacks that I was talking about. So if, if everyone in the call now does ZML, Stack list, they would only see one stack. I mean, I have created another stack in preparation, but you would be able to see one stack, the local stack, which has a local orchestrator, a local metadata store, and a local artifact store. So that's that's what everyone in the call currently has. It's um, it's very simple to see why, you know, I mean, this is very close to production anyway, the way it's set up, but, you know, it is all local. We want to get to a, a point where we can simply, the goal of ZML is, you take the exact same code that I just showed you, and you just literally um, run some CLI commands to configure your um, stacks and just run the Python command again, and then the pipeline will launch on the stack that you specify, right? That's that's the goal of ZML. There's a lot of complexity that is hidden from you. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna just simply um, replace the local orchestrator with a Qflow pipelines orchestrator. Um, and we're going to append a container registry to the stack. Now, this is these are the things that, you know, as you're using ZenML, maybe you're using uh, ZenML exactly like I just showed you, everything local, everything local to you. But at some point, you know, when you get to the point where you want to deploy a model you know, on a schedule, then you want to be able to swap out these stack components. And as you can see, it's still local. So, you know, for the purposes of the demo, I'm going to be deploying Qflow pipelines locally. Um, and ZenML actually helps you with this. So it sets up a local container registry, a local Qflow pipelines registry. But, you know, there's not a lot of steps from that setting to an actual Qflow pipelines running on Google Cloud or Amazon, um, where you have an S3 bucket for the artifact store and a Cloud SQL or something. Um, um, shared metadata store and a container registry, which is let's say the S3 container registry or GitHub or something or Docker Hub. So that's what we're gonna do now. So we're just gonna swap out these stacks and try to run this pipeline. So I've already done this. Um, one thing that might take a long time for you guys, and you know this is where you might lag a bit from where I am, is if you, if you run the next two cells, it's gonna try to deploy Qflow um, for you locally and deploy the container registry for you. Um, so 
while I'm talking and explaining these steps, maybe you can just run the next two. And I'm sure there might be some errors. We're going to try to fix them, but uh, if it's expected, it would it would spin up. Mm. So, okay, what are we doing? How, how do we actually create this stack? Um, well, it's quite easy. All you do is you um, first create the container registry, right? The container registry is you know, you just need to give it these commands. Uh, you need to give it a type of container registry. Right now it's, um, ah, that's something that I have not said, which is a very, very rightly somebody pointed in the in the Discord. You need to install K3D and um, kubectl before you do this. So excuse me for not saying that upfront, I, I might have uh, missed putting that in the in the notes. So like K3D is, I'm gonna to try to get up the installation notes here. K3D is a very simple um, tool that allows you to quickly launch a Kubernetes cluster on your machine. And the way you actually install it, depending on your machines is, let me just pipe that into the chat. Can I oh, send I, it? I put it in the chat, Hamza. All right, and kubectl is similar. So could you also share the kubectl? Yep, I'll do that. Awesome. Yeah, so that's a little prerequisite. I mean, of course, if you are going to run Kubeflow, you need Kubernetes, and Kubernetes needs uh, a, a little bit of overhead. And we don't actually take that opinion of installing these tools for you. I mean, it should be trivial enough to install these tools that are fantastic on their own and have great installation guides. Um, and you know, what we are going to do is we're going to take those tools and we're going to make them work in a way that um, you know um, makes it easy to deploy Kubeflow. Okay, um, maybe I just run this while that's happening. Um, so the first command that you see is the container registry, right? The re container registry is registering a local registry. What is a registry? It's basically, uh, let's say a storage um, piece where you're storing the, the Docker images that you create. So what XenML does is if you, if you run it, with a container registry and on an orchestrator that supports container images, it builds the Docker images for you. Another note, you also need Docker installed. So maybe Ben, you, you should also uh, pipe that in. Um, so what we're doing here is we're just, you know, simply building the image uh, around your code and we're pushing that to a local registry on the local host. I mean, again, this can be Google Container Registry, this can be Docker, or this can be um, GitHub, this can be Docker Hub. And that's the first step. Then what you're doing is you're registering the Kubeflow orchestrator um, um, orchestrator. So here's, it's also very simple. You just say, okay, I want the Kubeflow orchestrator to be registered. And you know the type of it is Kubeflow. And then you have these two extra infrastructure components that you've just created. And you can actually view them. So I'm gonna maybe list them out. So if you do Xenomer orchestrator list, you can actually see all the all the orchestrators. Uh, maybe I have my, uh, it's taking a while because I think my, I ran a pipeline, I ran a pipeline in the background. Yeah, oh, that's not the best formatted. Maybe I can do it on my terminal. That, that, that might be a better. That might be a better view, but you can already see a bit of it. So you have two orchestrators listed, and you can see that um, one is a local orchestrator, which is the Python kernel, and the other is the Kubeflow one. I'm just going to pop up my terminal just to show that in a nicer setting in a sec. There you go. So that's that's a bit neater. So you can see the Kubeflow orchestrator that we just registered, which port it is, what the Kubernetes constant is, and there's a few other properties. Um, everything is in the docs if you want to make this Kubeflow orchestrator a bit nicer. But for now, we're just going to use the defaults. Um, and then, as I said, we have a local stack, right? So all of these are captured inside a thing that we call um, local stack, and you want to 
put all these infrastructure pieces together in what we call the local queue flow stack, right? Um, and that's that's what the next step is. You just simply register uh, another stack. You call, you give it a name, and then you say, okay, use the local metadata store, the local artifact store, but use the queue flow orchestrator in the local registry, and then set it to be active. So that's that's the last key part. Um, you would have seen that if I actually do XML stack list before. Um, I mean, right now we have local queue flow as the um, like, or, or like before we used to have the local stack as the active stack, but now I switched it over to the local queue flow stack that we just created. So now every pipeline that runs uh, from within this XML repository will use that stack. It's not going to use the local stack anymore, right? And that's exactly what we're doing in the next cell. So the next cell is basically just running this pipeline and we have a utility for it that you can look at the code at. And this is what you're gonna see. So you're gonna see something like the same two things as you all, all, always saw, cache, uh, like this time we disabled the cache. And now you have, ah, suddenly the logs change, right? It's no longer doing what you it was supposed to be doing before with the local. It's now building a Docker image, and you can see the, the like like how it does that. It just installs requirements, uses a base image which you can specify, and then it tags it with localhost 5000 our local registry, and then it even pushes it to that registry, right? So then it says, okay, I'm going to use this stack for the local Kubeflow stack, and I'm going to run the pipeline. One thing I've neglected to mention so far, and this is where I'm going to switch over to the actual code, is that I have run this pipeline now at a schedule, right? So I have not run this only as a single pipeline on Qflow. I've just ran it on a, on, a, on a schedule and I'm gonna show you how you do that in the code. So within the code, the code that I executed had um, this thing. So just, just like we saw in the notebook, dot run, but then I actually gave it a schedule. It's very simple. You say okay, start now, and every thirty seconds start implementing. And you know, I, I know I promised one week, but we don't have one week for the entire demo. So all that's happening now is that every thirty seconds, it's going to keep executing this pipeline on Kubeflow on my local machine. And each time, it's going to query in the API. It's going to see if the drift is detected or not. And um, yeah, and that's going to keep happening. So you sort of productionalize your notebook here. And let me see see how that works. So when I actually spin up Qflow, so this is Qflow deployed locally for me. That happened in the back. You can see that the training pipeline, there's a new pipeline now. I think two already ran. The third one is running right now. And here you can already see that uh, my pipelines are running at a schedule of 30 seconds. One thing that I've neglected to mention, by the way, um, really sorry about that. I, I, I'm missing one crucial step. You do need to, after registering the stack, spin the stack up, right? And that's something I did um, like before it happened. You need to just do XenML stack up and that spins the entire Qflow up for you and prints out where the UI is. So I, I'm noticing some questions, Ben, on the, on the, uh, on the chat about that. So maybe people haven't done XML stack up, but how are we looking on the chat? Um, it's looking good. That question was actually about the ML flow UI, but um, oh. yeah, I, I think the chat is looking pretty good so far. Mm -hmm. How about you? Like, did you, were you able to spin the stack up? I'm having one issue because port 5,000 uh, is already in use on my computer uh, for the XML stack up, but I'm working on it. Okay, maybe someone can help on the chat. I think there's a way to, Change the port here to 5001 or something, but then that might cause a little problem with Qflow. So the best way is to kill whatever is happening on 5000. Okay, no worries. <laughs> okay, so anyway, I just wanted to show you. I mean, I'm going to keep talking, Ben, as you do it. Uh, you can see that the entire pipeline is finished. Now we went from this freaking pipeline running Drift using Evidently on a local setting. Now you have in a notebook, right? Using pretty much the same code, you've just swapped out a stack 
And now suddenly it's building Docker images. It's running on Qflow. Qflow is being deployed for you locally. It's a lot of work that is happening that just makes your life easier, right? And it's not hard to get from this point to actually deploying it on Qflow on AWS or GCP or Azure or whatever, wherever you want. And you know, you don't need to use Qflow. Uh, we have Airflow if you want to use that. Um, we have um, plans for, let's say, Prefect or Argo. Or, and even if you have your own orchestrator, you can just extend it. So um, that's the goal of ZML, that be able to swap out these pieces of infrastructure for you and provide the standardization layer which links everything together. So let me see on the Discord bot. Yeah, so you can see us drift detected, drift detected. Um, assuming that that wasn't um, that wasn't one of you guys, that was the Qflow thing that's posting this. So another run might have ran already. Yeah, we have another run already. So it's happening every 30 seconds. And um, yeah, the Discord alert is happening. We're going to happen in a second. So maybe I can just open that up, put it on the side. I think that was already it, actually. 7.02 p.m., yeah. Yeah, and there it was, so. Yeah, and it's gonna keep happening. Um, so, yeah, we have it deployed with Qflow. Ben, do you have any questions so far? I was gonna save a couple questions for the end. Mm -hmm. uh, see if anybody else has any. If anybody yeah. have questions, feel free to throw them in the chat right now. Yeah, but it's a, uh, I think it's a um, it's a point to pause and just looking over there. I think people are talking about the five thousand Mac problem. Yeah, I, I think that the if the port is occupied, you're going to have a little trouble. I think that's something that we want to pop into the issues to make that a bit easier. Um, yeah, but I mean the port is configurable, so I, I, I mean we, we should be able to change that. I'm not able to replicate it locally, but uh, I guess the people in the chat are trying to figure it out. So I'll like take the liberty to keep moving on. Uh, hopefully it, it gets fixed. You can also run by the way, like the next cells without having the Kubeflow stack running. So we're just gonna switch back to the local stack now for the next pipeline, just because we've already displayed the local, um, the Kubeflow stack. Okay, cool. So now we have, so, 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 so that's the end of chapter two. Chapter two was you trained some pipelines um, locally. Well, chapter one was you trained some pipelines locally. Chapter two was you deployed it on Kubeflow pipelines of, or, or, like a legit orchestrator with a container registry and dockerized code um, all happening for you behind the scenes. And chapter three is what do you do with these trained models, right? I mean, at the end, we wanted to actually get predictions. Where are my predictions? Well, of course you need another pipeline. I mean, the training pipeline is separate. It, it happens on a separate tangent. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's gonna run every 30 seconds for my machine, but you know, it's gonna, um, you know, like in the real world setting, it might be a week or a month and inference maybe runs every three days, let's say. So the way inference works is you wanna import your data. You wanna import the latest data only. You wanna pre-process it the same way that it happened in the training pipeline. You want to extract um, or, or well, import it, then extract the next week's data. And then you have, a, there is a step in this inference pipeline, which is an important step, which is you want to pick your model, which is the best model out of all the training pipelines. So let's say you have a thousand training pipelines. You, have, you, you need to have some sort of heuristic of picking models. Maybe that's the accuracy. Maybe it's the fact that drift was detected or not. Maybe it's the fact that I don't know, something else changed and you want to take the December model. Anyway, you have you need to encode some way of picking the right model, and then you need to send it over to the predictor, which actually does the predictions with the latest data, right? That that's what you want to do. So here's how the inference pipeline looks like. Again, I'm not I'm disabling the cache for this because it's always going to query new data. So let's just disable the cache, right? Um, it looks the same as as this diagram. Um, and you can see that we get some readable predictions at the end. So let's run that through and actually run it in the inference pipeline. So something is happening, like something interesting is happening here. So while, when it comes to the model picker, 
it's actually now taking the latest results of the repository and it's trying to figure out which model to use. And I'm going to show you that logic in, in the actual code. So you can, you can see that within your steps, here you have a model picker. Within the model picker, you have the logic that I just talked about. So how do you do that? Within a ZNML pipeline step, you want to have some sort of function that doesn't take as input anything, but returns the model that you want, the best model, and the associated run ID that it has um, with it. These are the two things that you'd want as information to put in the inference pipeline. And it's relatively trivial how to do it, but you, the cool thing is the same post-execution workflow that we used outside of the pipeline in the notebook, we exposed to you within the step. So you can actually initialize a repository, um, get the pipeline. This actually, I mean, in the news, uh, like XML version, you can pass the context here and get the metadata stored directly from that. But like here, you can we're fetching the repository. So this might change this part of the code, but anyway, you're gonna, you're gonna find that you can do the same functions as you always are used to in the step. You get specifically the training pipeline, right? That's the name of the pipeline that you wanna query. You wanna go through all its runs and you wanna get the tester step, the step that actually evaluates on testing data. You wanna read those values. It's gonna be a single float and you're gonna print it out. We have some exception handling here, but that's all that's all that's happening. So if the um, yeah, if the model also exists, so I mean for that same run, you're also going to get the model. And if the model, if the mean absolute accuracy and the model um, exist, and if it's not the best score so far, I initialize the best score in the best model in the best run accordingly. So this is quite trivial logic, right? You just are looping through the entire run space of this training pipeline. This might be a thousand iterations or something. Um, then you're finding the best score. And then when you do find the best score or a score that is higher than any other score you've seen before, you're just plugging that into the best model, the best score and the best run. And at the end, you're just returning the best model and printing out the best score. So a oh, little exception here. Maybe something changed. I'll take a look at that in a second, but um, like we're able to see, I mean, until this point that it shows the model, which was on the 26th of Jan 22 with the mean absolute accuracy of 3.13. And that was the model that it actually sent to the post processor step. Let me actually, see what failed here. I think it might, might've been a copy pasta. So it says no step found for naming coder. Let's see. Where's the encoder here? It's a classic live, live demo situation here, but uh, I'm not gonna make jokes, but uh, I'm gonna try to do, fix it as quickly as possible. Yeah, it looks like it's, unfortunately, it looks like the um, the pipeline it chose was perhaps already running. So there was a little race condition and, and that, that's a little exception, I think, because it's still running. I'm, I'm just gonna go over and stop, disable our training pipelines. So if that does happen to you, what's probably happening is that there's a run running, right? This one probably that has gone past the training step, has produced a great model, but hasn't done the testing step yet. And we, by accident, ran the inference probably during the middle of the of that. And I mean, that's that's a condition that I haven't even thought about before, never happened before, but you know, that's how that must go. Let's see if it happens again. Um, I mean, we should have had some sort of logic in that um, model picker step, Maybe that's an improvement we can make, which said, okay, if the pipeline is still running, you know, skip that pipeline. So a question on that model picker. So because mm -hmm. you wrote that, if you, for example, were using the ML models integration, you could just directly query the ML flow UI yeah. here because of your integration, right? Exactly, exactly. You could do that as well. So you have full access to ML flow here. So you can just query that and find, find that through this. Okay. 
Okay, perfect. So um, that ran through. That was a little bug uh, as I explained it to you. I think I diagnosed that correctly. Um, and then and then you can actually initialize the repository again, get the pipeline, get, like get the step that you want and print out the first predictions. So that's your inference pipeline with a complete link to, to this, um, you know, to this, uh, like to the previously best model that was trained in the training pipeline. And that looks very like the, like a real world production setting. Uh, this is a proper MLOps stack. It's detecting drift, it's posting and persisting whether drift happened or not. When it's running every 30 seconds, it's running an inference pipeline on the side that has a link to the best model. And it's all running outside of your computer, potentially on a Google Cloud or AWS or whatever. And if you see now, don't nail me down to it. Um, but basically I can tell you that Golden State Warriors, where is where is Golden State Warriors? Ah, Golden State Warriors aren't playing this. So Orlando, I think, and LA are basically gonna play and Orlando is gonna score 10 three-pointers. So if you wanna make a bet, go ahead. Also, you know, this, this model is off by a mean absolute accuracy of like three, three pointers. So if you want to do 13, that's also fine. <laughs> anyway, the, the point wasn't to get um, the best model and you guys can surely improve this. Maybe you can actually make, add a step to the pipeline that creates a real time bet um, or something, but uh, I won't take that chance. But if you guys can see how easy it is to get the inference pipeline. And you know you could also pop these inference results over to a snowflake or something, right? And that's, again, as I said, you can materialize this any way you want. And you can put it in ML flow, let's say, and ML flow would then have a complete link between your training pipelines and inference pipelines. There's no, you know, there's no disconnect anymore between how a model was trained. So if you ever want to go across lineage, if you want to see Man, how did this exact prediction, this exact data point, this prediction come about? All you have to do is get the pipelines, see which steps happened, what was the best model that produced, pop that over to the repository of ZenML, find which uh, like training pipeline ran, and you know you have a complete link between, between the whole story. So it's, for us, it's like a 360 degree view across the entire MLOps landscape. Um, which is extensible, easy to use, and gives you a state like, hopefully Sam is our mascot Sam, which she is in where there's so many things happening around her, but with these simple commands, you can get to that. All right, I'm at 7.15, I didn't overstretch it. I never ran through this demo before today, so I'm happy that it went through as it did. I'm gonna stop now, field some questions maybe from Ben or the people in the chat. Otherwise, uh, we can also wrap. Cool. Uh, yeah, if anybody has questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, Hamza, thanks so much for this demo. This is really, really cool. Uh, I had a little bit of an issue with the pipelines part, but the chat helped me get through that. Um, I really like the entire concept here of pulling together different integrations that are enabled by both closed source companies, but also open source tools like MLflow and Kubeflow um, yeah. and kind of as NML can connect to each of them individually. I'm curious about how uh, somebody would add an integration to ZenML if ZenML hasn't like pre-built an integration. So let's say there's a new ML tracking tool, or maybe I want to use weights and biases or something. How would I add or be able to use that integration if I'm building a ZenML pipeline? Um, it would be it would be very um, easy. So we have this we have this integration registry that gets activated whenever Python is invoked. And we have a way to track all the integrations that are active. So everything is happening in Python, right? So if you, I mean, you can see a bunch of integrations that are there already. And um, if you wanted to, let's say, include weights and biases in it, and that's, if you do do that, let us know because we would love to have that pull request. This is completely open source. Um, we, we can just like go over to, like what's similar to the weights and biases, ML flow, right? So you can just go over there and just see the integration and see how that works. And I mean, like specifics of the integration, you can, I mean, I, I think it might take too much time to go over, but what's the only thing you really need to do is put it in a folder 
where I put it in a module. Um, usually we put it in the init.py and in, uh, extend the integration ZML class, right? This one. And give it a name. We give it ML flow this, give its requirements, and then call this check installation function that sort of checks whether ML flow is installed or not. Um, that's the basic thing you, that you need in your code base um, to, to register an integration with ZML. After that's what you cool. do, yeah, after what you do with it, that's something that you can look at in the particular integration details and in, in, in how that works. Cool. That, that that's really cool. I like uh, tools that are extensible and you can kind of build and, and throw in your own things. It kind of reminds me of of Airflow's um, integrations. Yeah. Uh, and the way that you can add on them. Absolutely. I mean, that's the goal. Like, you know, this task is probably way bigger than us. We we need support from from people um, from people who are actually. Uh, going to contribute and add integrations like you just said and we one of the basic design goals of ZML was to make it as extensible as possible and as modular as possible we're always going to be open source um, the ZML core libraries will always be open source you can use it without any help and hopefully it gets better and better over time um, what we do if you don't want to make an actual pull request maybe that's too much there are two ways that you can help us one is whether you just try this out and you raise an issue. So for example, Ben, maybe you can create an issue that the port 5,000 wasn't working. That helps us sort of tackle these bugs and you can see that we're very quick with that. Um, the other thing is if you even don't wanna do that, but you wanna see a particular integration installed, you can go to our GitHub and into our discussions and within our discussions, we have um, voting, right? So we have feature voting. So let's say, what we were wondering about is, I mean, I haven't shown you deployment yet, right? So we haven't really talked about how, like how exactly do we deploy a model with ZML I mean, because we use batch inference. Um, but you can see that our community has already voted for ML flow deployer as the next deployer. So we're already targeting that in our roadmap, which is something that you can see in the projects here. So you can see we did evidently we're doing Y logs now. I, I wasn't able to show you Y logs, unfortunately, an integration that just released. It's a data profiling tool, completely awesome. Really love that tool as well. Um, and then we have the ML flow deployer, which is planned. Um, and you know, we're already way ahead of schedule, so we can, we're gonna pull things in from the next quarter. But yeah, everything is open. We believe in this really open culture. We have a newsletter where we share struggles and like tribulations that we have internally. Uh, and a podcast that we talk to ML practitioners about. So, you know, this is a core part of the company is to communicate what we're doing. And I just want to emphasize that it would be really cool to have other people come in from this community and others to sort of join in this effort and make make things as easy as they look in this demo. Yeah, that that's awesome. Um, there's two questions here. I think the first one you sort of already answered uh, when you're building it. ZenML pipeline. If you're building a, you know, one specific for your team, how would you get support? I'm assuming that's through GitHub issues and uh, through your Discord, right? Yeah. Well, through Slack. So Slack, uh, Discord is what we use internally, but Slack, Slack is our external tool because people awesome. seem to like Slack a bit for communities. But it's like you can go to uh, zenML.io/slack-invite. That's uh, zenML.io forward slash. Very cool. Slack so, session invite, and you can just join our Slack. I, I'm, I'm lagging here in my screen, but uh, I, it would be nice if someone shared that in the in the chat. Okay, I'll, I'll throw that in. Yeah, thank you. And the other question that we're getting um, is if you're trying to host a machine learning application through a REST API on a server, for example, um, and you want to incorporate ZenML in that, how would you go about doing that? So if you're hosting, uh, what, sorry, I missed it acoustically. Um, if you're hosting some REST API server that's that you're using internally for machine learning applications. Yeah, yeah um, I mean, so, yeah. so it's, I mean, as long as it's Pythonic, as long as you're, the way to interact with that API server is something that you expose Python SDK for, or a Python, uh, you know, a Python client for, you can simply pop that in to, to a step, right? And just make that work. I mean, we're going to take care of the Qflow stuff and we're going to take care of the, all the, and the flow integrations and all that for you. But if you have some specific things, either you can just put that in a step manually, or, I mean, as we just talked about, Ben, you could go ahead and create a pull request for an integration if you want your library also to be public. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's super cool. I think um, 
maybe uh, if I'm understanding the question correctly, I, I could imagine um, we just saw in, in this pipeline example that uh, Hamza was pulling the, great, the the latest model and making a prediction. If you're hosting your model, if, is what I think you're saying, um, on a REST API, you could just as easily, I imagine, call that REST API in your ZenML pipeline, like Hamza said, um, and get your predictions in, in that kind of low latency way. Um, I actually had a question, Hamza. Uh, it, it's kind of cool. It got me thinking about it from the way your notebook uh, is, in, is, is implemented. You're pulling in a lot of your steps uh, from code um, and you're yeah. using them in a notebook, which is how I also like to, to do notebook development um, because the, the real meat of the code is, is still in a code base where the yeah. notebook is sort of for experimentation and stringing it together. Um, this to me seems like a really good way to do uh, version control management, right? All of your ZenML steps are in a repo. You in any of your code environments can clone that repo, install yeah. those steps and kind of import them. Um, is there any other way that you guys are kind of internally doing version control um, or are you yeah. also relying on this kind of code base? So we're sort of, so as I said, th th there are a few ways where we do version control for code. So for data, you already know, you materialize data in, in the artifact store and then we sort of track it, right? So data is versioned according to that. Um, and for, for code, we have multiple layers of versioning. So one simple way is that we hash the step. So we, we simply, if you, if you open up a step, if I change this particular step, right, um, in any way, ZenML will know that you changed it and will disable caching. So that's one way that we sort of control versions. Um, the other way is of course, what I showed you in the Docker image. We're, we're building up a Docker image from this repository. Um, and that Docker image is being pushed to uh, clearly marked with the pipeline run ID registry. Right, so you always, if you if you look at a run ID, you can always go back to the container and see what the code was. So so that's the other way. But there's there was there was another way, pre 0.6.0, um, which we have taken out temporarily, is we also used to pop into the metadata store, um, uh, Git SHA, uh, of your latest commit. So that's something that we're also going to add in the future versions, hopefully back in. We were just struggling internally with some uh, some like minor design problems as you do. But I mean, generally, of course, we're gonna pop the git, git commit in. So because the actual source of the steps and pipelines is in code, we would expect the user to first commit them, right? And then run the ZenML pipelines in your notebook. And then ZenML is gonna pick out in your modules, the SHA, and gonna pop that into the, um, into the metadata store for you to query in the post execution workflow. That's awesome. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. I definitely, Love those GitHub integrations. Cool. Um, well, we are just about wrapping up on time. We have five minutes left. If anybody has any final questions, definitely throw them in the chat. Uh, we can wait for a couple seconds, see if anybody's posting anything. Um, if um, not, Hamza, if you have any closing remarks, go for it. Yeah, I mean, I, I do have a closing remark. My closing remark is that I wanna give a huge shout out to, to the ZenML team who without them, I wouldn't be able to do this presentation today. and um, you know, they just put in the midnight oil to get get this beautiful notebook in front of you. Um, you know, ready, looking beautiful. This is none of my like. It's not. I'm just a part of this whole machine um, that actually is contributing every day and working hard to build and which like build this open source repository and to like sort of deliver on the vision that people are looking at us for that we're going to be the Zen of ML ops, right? So everyone here in this particular team, um, I enjoy working with every day. Um, I'm, I'm, I think like more than lucky to to actually work with them. So like, thank you everyone for them, um, like from the team and outside of the team, if you really like what you saw today, go to um, our GitHub, you can Google it or you can just say github.com slash zenml dash io slash zenml, um, give us a star maybe, that's the least maybe uh, easy thing, but you know, it does you know, help get visibility. Uh, but what would really help is if you tried it out, used it at your work or your hobby projects and created issues and give us feedback. Um, that would be that would be fantastic. Awesome. Uh, one final question. When uh, these runs, these pipelines are running in ZML, are they running asynchronously or are they running synchronously? For the local orchestrator, they're running synchronously, but for Qflow, you saw them running asynchronously. 
Awesome. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, amazing. Well, Hamza, thank you so much. Thanks to the entire uh, ZenML team. And thanks to everybody on uh, the MLOps channel that's here listening with us. <laughs>